Hi, this is Scott Bradfield, and this is the latest episode of Reading Great Books in the Bathtub. Our challenge is this massive uh, testament to water displacement, J.R. by William Gaddis. It is, as I tried to say in the introduction, one of my favorite novels by a writer who I don't consider a great novelist. I think his, his other books are have good and bad things in them, but this is a masterpiece, and it's his easily his best book. It's most fluid, his most effortless book. And it feels effortless, though it's a huge amount of work, obviously. And it's very funny. If you can just focus enough on what's happening in the story and enjoy the chaos of the characters and know that you're in good hands because this apparent chaos is incredibly well organized and orchestrated and, and Wagnerian, and as the, the metaphor of Wagner runs throughout. Um, you, you, for, to enjoy this book, you will be tempted to do as I did the first times, and that is to read books about it, to read summaries of the plot. I've, uh, they're, they're available online. Stephen Moore has been one of the champions of Gaddis for years and has provided chapter-by-chapter -chapter synopses. Stay away from them. Try to read it like a, a, a novel. You will need a few things, and, and I'm going to suggest a few tools to help you read the book. A red pen will help. Okay, this is a hard book to make notes in because it's so big. It's kind of hard to get the pen around. And but you want to be able to note major, almost any character with a name that shows up in this book. You kind of want to underline and remember who they are, or at least be able to go back and find them and remember who they are because they aren't. Uh, they they come at they come at you fast and furious. And every name almost that comes into the book, and every character that comes into the book will have significance in the book. They will affect the story, they will affect the other characters, and this huge concatenation of events will all be uh, part of one large orchestrated movement. So try to remember every character that comes up, or most of them. I'm going to take you through today. You might also want two visual aids. Okay, throw away your books on Leotard, your Derrida, throw away all those big massive books about the postmodern novel. They won't help you enjoy this book. Um, you need two visual aids. Money, American money. It's a piece of paper. It's worth nothing. It's it's worth what, it's worth the promise that it offers, and that's all it offers. And this, uh, another another form of paper. Um, the general roll. Uh, there's a company called General Roll that's introduced very early in the book, uh, which is a uh, a company that makes piano rolls, so everyone can pretend they're artists. The difference between arts and the artists and the crap that's produced to seem like art is one of the big themes of J.R. and that general role is running throughout the book. This is being transferred into this and into that, into this, and into shit, basically. There's, there's more scatological humor in this book than you'll be able to handle sometimes, but at any time you think they're talking about shit, they are talking about shit, and it's all being flushed into this huge monster of an American nightmare capitalism. Okay, it's 1975. Right? It, 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 is, it is a book that is the, the, the nightmare of America that, that, that many writers talked about for hundreds of years, and Gaddis is talking about in 1975, has been, reached its fulfillment and its apotheosis in our Koch brothers, Trump-driven, nightmare, billionaire universe. Whatever, whatever type of billionaire is out there, they're all like these characters, producing crap and power out of that crap. So... Um, that's the, my, my, my fastest intro to the book. You want to think of those two things. They're going to be changing. They'll be coming up. Everything that seems like a metaphor of one is a metaphor of the other. And you will see it from the very beginning of the book. I'm going to try... This is going to be an experiment. I'm going to try to do quite a few of these short uh, lectures. And I'm going to ask you to come to the lecture after you've read the book. Don't... don't for example, I'm going to talk about page 1 to 40. Page 40 about uh, this, this today. If you haven't read the first 40 pages for yourself, stop this lecture right now and go off and read them. Focus on each character. And then when you're done, come back to me and maybe you'll hear a little bit more about what was happening. Maybe you've missed some things. And then you might want to go back and reread it. You don't have to reread the book all the way through, but try to get a sense of those first 40 pages because you're meeting a lot of characters and you want to see how the book operates. The opening of the book, now I'm going to take you through sort of page by page. I, I haven't made many notes. I have a couple of notes of things I'd like to bring up, but uh, I, I'm, I'm going to do a very imperfect job of this because I've read this book a few times and enjoyed it every time, uh, 
except the first couple of times. And I'm enjoying it like hell this time. And I'm just going to try to remember everything to tell you. I can't tell you everything. But let's look at the opening six lines. You don't know who anybody is when you start this book. You shouldn't. But you see a dialogue occurring. And you should be able to hear there's two people talking. And then I'll explain who they are. First page. Money in a voice that rustled. Paper, yes. And we'd never seen it, paper money. It looked so strange the first time we saw it. Lifeless. You couldn't believe it was worth a thing. Not after father jingling his change. Those were silver dollars. Okay, so we were introduced to the Bast sisters. This is Anne and Julia. And they're going to be significant characters at the beginning of the book, and then you'll see what happens later. Anne and Julia are recurring... Are, are talking to a lawyer named Cohen, C-O-E-N. He's going to be an important minor character in the book. And they're describing their family history of coming east from the west where money was real silver, real silver. And their father was, I forget what their father did, but their father deals with real money. He's a real overly, when he's overly practical Protestant Americans. And he just, uh, it just, he, he doesn't, he, his, both his sons want to become musicians. And he throws them out of the house, basically. Uh, he just into the money. And these two women are talking about coming east and finding everything becoming something kind of phony. All right? Now, that's just, they live in this big old aristocratic house. And in this long conversation of the first 10 to 15 pages between these two old women and Cohen, we're see, hearing them speak, and then we're seeing everything kind of broken. The chair arms are falling off. It's all this old aristocratic crap that has never been fixed. And these old women have never fixed anything. And the carpets are falling apart. And it, it's, everything is just a shambles. And the house is overgrown with plants. And outside are all these vines. And they've just eaten up this whole yard. Out beyond the house is the emergence of this modern, ugly America we all live in. Strip malls and bingo parlors, and, and they're building more and more roads. And there, there's a lot of hammering going on in this scene. And the girls, the old ladies, will often refer to the hammering. The hammering, they're chopping down trees and just building more and more crap. Now, that metaphor of this kind of is all going to escalate in the book. It's just going to get wilder and wilder, and this, this, this noise outside, the crashing of the cars, there'll be lots of car crashings outside will all be part of this giant world emerging outside of these old ladies hidden away in their home. Now, they're talking to this lawyer named Cohen, and there's a few important things to think about in this. Um, Cohen's trying to... He, he's coming to the old women because their brother Thomas has died intestate. And there's, he has not left a will, and he's left a lot of money, He's left a lot of money, particularly in this company called General Roll, which produces piano rolls, but really the General Roll is pretty clear what Gaddis, the joke is. And he's trying to find out who the inheritance, who should inherit this estate. The old man Thomas, who's died, had a brother named James. I'm going to give you this little, you need to kind of know this while you're getting into this book. He and, he and James were the, were the, ones who earned a lot of money, and they both were co-owners, I believe, of this General Roll Corporation. And there was a girl named Nellie who married Thomas. And he, she married Thomas, but she ran away with James and had a child named Edmund. Edmund is the central character of the book. And in this long, kind of t complicated co conversation, Cohen is trying to explain that Edmund, if they can prove is actually, if he's actually the son of Thomas could be an inheritor of this estate. So that's what this whole conversation is really about. But in the course of it, these dotty old women are just telling him everything. And it's a very another, again, there's a one continuous metaphor through the whole book, which is there's this chaos of information and then some poor bastard trying to organize it. And Cohen is trying to organize all this information about this family, which is which which many of the stuff he's throwing away is very important, but he doesn't know what's important and what's not. So he's coming to this chaotic house, these chaotic old women, and he tries to organize, and he's trying to meet Edmund. And in the course of it, he's, he's brought a paper he needs Edmund to sign. In the course of talking to these old women, Edmund literally just walks through the house and leaves, and the old ladies don't even tell uh, Cohen he's there. So he goes off to work, 
and Cohen gets a little frustrated. Right? Uh, in the course of it, he brings up a legal principle which is worth thinking about, and they bring it up. He term, comes up with a term, and the quote is, the defense of infancy is not available to the adult. He's trying to, I, I'm, the legal argument I think he's trying to make is that Edmund cannot, uh, Ed, Edmund cannot later challenge the will by saying, I didn't know I was too young, unless he is young enough. So the, Cohen is trying to find out the age of Edmund to find out if they can use a certain legal argument about whether he's a child or not. And that's an important thing because the notion of children and children who are innocent and who are not so innocent is another metaphor through the book. Or another, another story. I don't know if they're just metaphors. There's, there's the story. Okay. Now, let's think about that whole, ch that whole section goes on to about page 17. And we learn most of that information. We also know that, learn that um, Edmund has a cousin named Stella Angel. She's, I think she's married a man named Angel. And the angel was originally Engels. There's a lot of Marx jokes in this. Uh, Engels just translated into angel. And his cousin, Edmund and his cousin Stella, have a sort of an affair kind of conflict throughout the book. Kind of a love-hate relationship. And the, the husband, Angel, is not a very nice man, as I recall. It's been a long time. Now we get to page 17. We get a lot of, sort of, a lot of information that comes out of this very, very funny chaotic conversation with these two dotty old women as the whole world is being built outside and hammering and hammering and hammering. Now, let page 17, we're going to see an important technique. We're going to see almost entirely dialogue through this book, almost all dramatic dialogue. Things are happening around us as the dialogue takes place. So you can actually hear and see things happening while people talk. You'll get very little, little descriptive passages, very little telling who's speaking. You'll just have to kind of guess and listen. It's pretty easy to do if you pay attention. And he will control the scenes. So, for example, in the first scene of 17 pages, we only have three principal characters in there, and, and they're talking. So you can sort of identify them. Then, when we change scenes, we're going to have a long descriptive passage, usually. It's often a half a page or a page. It's often one sentence, and maybe always one sentence. And it's basically taking us through characters moving through highways and freeways and walking from one place to another. I'll give you an example at the bottom of page 17. Cohen leaves, runs off trying to get Edmund. And remember, this is very farcical. You've got people coming in and out of doors. It's pure farce. And, you know, and, and he, he's, everyone's dashing off in, in, in chaotic uh, events. And he, as he runs off, the old ladies are talking about how the house is always bashing and crashing outside. And then the bottom of page 17, as Cohen drives off, we hear this. To the squeal of brakes, the car burst out into the world, trailing a festoon of privet. You can't drive in and out of this property without getting entangled in all these old past vines and, and plants. Swerved at the immediate prospect of open acres flowered in funereal abundance to regain the pavement and lose it again in a brief threat to the candy wrappers and beer cans nestled along the hedge line up the highway that quickly out of sight to the widow's window's half-shaded stare from the roof pitches frowning over the hedge to where it ended and a yellow barn took up and was gone in a swerving mist for the pepperidge tree towering ahead past shadeless windows in a naked farmhouse sprawl, at the corner where the road trimmed neatly into the suburban labyrinth, and things came scaled down to wieldy size, dogwood, then barbary, becoming streaked blood red for fall, past the firehouse. And ba basically, we take this long trip until we land at the school. And this is a junior high school. The kids are from like 6th grade to 8th grade, I think. They're pretty young. The youngest one seemed to be about 12 years old. That's J.R., the central character. And we arrive there, and we hear two people talking. And that's Mrs. someone's talking to Mrs. Joubert. And the person speaking to Mrs. Joubert, the dialogue is all set off with these little dashes, like in Joyce, a writer who Gaddis claims he never read. I, I sort of believe that. He's not at all like Joyce, though he does use this technique. And Mrs. Joubert is a very important character. She doesn't have a huge... She doesn't come up... She's not a strong character when she first appears, but she's a very important character. Very uh, sad. All the characters are sad, failures, really desperate, really unhappy people who are going through really terrible events in their lives. And as I recall, she comes from. She was raised in foreign uh, Switzerland, 
and she's teaching social studies at this school. And she has a paper bag full of money, $27 that she's collected from all the students. And they're going to take this bag, paper bag of money and go buy a single piece of stock in New York. And she wants to teach the kids how America works. So that's the opening joke. Now, this little sack of money is going to be very important. This, so will the, every, every little moment will be important. She's speaking to a man named Whiteback. Whiteback is the principal of this school. It's a nightmarish school. And as soon as we enter the school, um, in the next page, we have another little brief bit of description. So whenever you have a descriptive passage that goes on for more than a, a line or two, it's usually moving us from one scene to another. And we go into the house, into the school, and we see something over the door, which is Greek letters. But basically, it's from each accord. So these Greek letters are actually been put up there by Gibb and Shepperman. I think his name is Shepperman, who never shows up in the book. And Gibb and Shepperman have been playing a lot of games around this school, and that's one of them. They put a quote from Marx up over the front of the door. And as we enter the school... We have uh, basically a school night in the 70s in which all the kids do is sit and watch television. They all sit and watch different televisions, and when they're not watching television, they're being televised. They're being recorded. And this whole show, uh, school is monitored and projecting television and lectures and everything that goes on in every classroom. And they're spending all their money on technology and very little on books. There's a big joke. They spent like $200, $1,200 on books and $12,000 on, on something else. And, and, and it's all about kind of monitoring and testing these kids. 1973, again, we just see the apotheosis of this crap today. And all they have to do is be tested and, 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 and write down the right information. And whenever anyone stops trying to teach these kids, there's just chaos, normal kids. At one point... Gibbs shows up. He, one of the most interesting characters in the book and one of my favorite comic characters of all time is Mr. Gibbs. He shows up at the bottom of page 20 and he walks into one of the classrooms. He shuts the television off, says, stop watching this crap, and he gives the kids a little lecture. And this is, one of his, this is his first appearance in the book and it's worth listening to this lecture. Page 20, bottom of page 20. All right, let's have order. Order. He reached the set himself and snapped it into darkness. Put on the lights there now. Before we go any further here, has it ever occurred to any of you that all this is simply one grand misunderstanding? Since you're not here to learn anything, but to be taught so you can pass these tests, knowledge has to be organized so it can be taught, and it has to be reduced to information so it can be organized. Do you follow that? In other words, this leads you to assume that organization is an inherent property of the knowledge itself and that disorder and chaos are simply irrelevant forces that threaten it from outside. In fact, it's exactly the opposite. Order is simply a thin, perilous condition we try to impose on the basic reality of chaos. He's telling this to a bunch of 12 and 15 year old kids who could care less. And the basic principle is the principle of the story, which is every time someone tries to put down a system of order, whether it's legal order or education or, or, uh, or, or artistic order, anywhere just this chaos just bubbles up out of everything that happens in the book and this idea that you know you you, you organize information so the kids can repeat that information and that information becomes knowledge is one of the horrible horrible images of jr now we move into um a meeting miss flesh is there mr hyde is there um, and the um, Mr. Whiteback, the principal, are in there. And they go in to talk about all the money that they're producing and where the money's coming from. And they're getting money from a large foundation, which is writing a book about how this school is completely, basically, technologized. Everything is going to be run through, 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 uh, comp- through uh, televisions and, and television cameras. And in the course of it, there's lots of... They're flipping around on... Um, cameras because they're watching all the different classes. We meet Miss Flesh, we meet Assemblyman Petchy, um, and all of these characters are talking about all the money coming in and out of the school. And we meet Coach Vogel, who's who's really this meathead a PE teacher. So you want to keep all these names together. They all belong to this school. 
And in the course of it, we're also seeing these little block passages, which are lectures being held in the different classrooms as they're flicking through in, the, in this principal's office. They're looking at everybody's, uh, how everybody's doing in the classrooms. In every one of the lectures, they're just talking about money. They're talking about economics. They're talking about history for money. They're talking about industrialization. And even this long metaphor of the human body, which Coach Vogel has cooked up with some sort of fake robot, which I think starts to take over the section of the school at one point. There's a fake ro this He's created this fake man. And he's every metaphor for the human body is as if it's an industrial business. It's producing things. and it's in, It spends so much in, in it. In it. It produces this, and it's all talked about in capitalist terms, the human body. In the course of it, they're also talking about Miss Flesh, who inherited an idea from a guy named Shepperman. Shepperman is not in the book, as I recall. He's one of Gibbs's friends, and he's a bit of a crazy character who got thrown out of the school, who initiated the idea that this, this junior high school should produce a version of Das Rheingold, the... the, uh, <laughs> the uh, the Wagner Opera, which everyone in the book thinks is was written by uh, Mozart. So they're going to produce this Wagnerian Das Rheingold, and they're going to produce it at a Jewish temple. They're going to present it at a Jewish temple. So it, this is the type of chaos we're talking about. Now, they go through that, and about page 32, we have, we, we come to the, uh, we come into the room where the, the Bast is is rehearsing Das Rheingold with all these girls, these teenage girls dressed up like Rhine maidens. And a little boy named J.R. is going to eventually show up. He's the central character of the book. He's playing, I forget, can't remember how to pronounce his name, is it Algaric, the dwarf who's taking the money, stealing the money. And the little girls, while they're practicing this play, they keep going, they're supposed to be dancing around the gold, the Rhine gold, and there's nothing on the table. And they say, how can we pretend there's gold if we don't even have something there to pretend is gold? The kids just have no imagination whatsoever. And eventually, I think, this pack of money, the, the bag of money from, uh, from Mr. Joubert gets there. Now, we're going to have, this is a pretty funny scene. At one point, they're supposed to be playing these big uh, Wagnerian uh, passages, and Bast is playing on the piano, and he's got these student musicians, one of whom comes in playing a trumpet or a or bugle. And the kid can't play anything except uh, the morning roll or something from the, from the military. So every time, every time it's his turn to play this part from Wagner, he just keeps playing da 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 and so forth. So this whole crazy scene starts coming along. Um, and in the course of this scene, by about page 40, 42, the, the JR grabs some of this money and just takes off. And that's pretty much where I want to stop. Is with, If you read through this scene, you're basically seeing this chaos of all these kids, all these kids talking. And Bast and a guy named Dan DeCephalus is a psychologist who's also had all sorts of, like, He's done all sorts of crappy jobs around the school, and now I think he's the school psychologist, De Cephalus. There's something funny about his wife, Anne, starts, she shows up, and she's clearly flirtatious with Edmund. And they go off chasing after Jr., who's stolen this little bit, bit of money. Now, that's, I'm going to stop right there. That's a lot to cover. All these names you should get yourself familiar with as you're going through it, they're going to all come back recognize Edmund is our central character, and this little boy who sort of vanished is our second most important character. And Gibbs and Mrs. Joubert are the ones you really need to know. But you need to, you need to remember that Hyde and this foundation people show up. I think there's a Mr. Ford, and there's another one. There's, a, there's Assemblyman Petchy. All of these characters will keep coming into it, and we're going to go off to other places than the school. But we will be coming back to this nightmarish school. And even minor, minor characters like Vogel will start to accelerate and, and accumulate narrative power in this book because it's a perfectly put together book. All right, that's I'm going to stop now. I'll give you a breather for a few days, me a breather, and I'll try to maybe you know do a longer set of, 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 section, of passages in the next, next uh, lecture 
Um, but it's hard to skip too much of this because there's so many things happening in, in the book. All right. Thanks for being patient. Go give it a try. You should have a really good time with this book. Try to avoid all the books about it. And just take the patience to, to understand how he's telling the story. You should know all the major characters now in the first 40 pages. And we'll, we'll carry on this experiment. Okay, bye.